did with the uh, properties uh, of particles and bonding one, where I'm going to go through last year's exam paper, and we'll just look at different ways students have answered and how the markers have marked it. So what you really need to watch out for. So there's generally some way, and it's normally the first question, some easy section on writing names and drawing molecules. So for example, what we've got there. So um, I think instead of trying to work, or actually no, let's work it out. So what you need to do, so I'm just going to check. Where is my cursor there? I'm just going to take a different color. All right. So always when you start is count the number of atoms. And you'll see the people that did got excellence tended to write on their question papers. So that is the first carbon. That is the second carbon. That is the third carbon. And that's the fourth carbon. Now, why did I start numbering from the right and not from the left? Not sure? OK. Um, I've got two functional groups here. One is the uh, chlorine, a halogen. And I've got the carbonyl, which is actually bonded to two other carbons. And it's a ketone priority. So the ketone is a dominant functional group, so the name is going to end in own, and it has to be the lowest number. So we had to make that two, because if we counted from the other end, it would have been three. So what we've basically got is the three, and then between a number and a letter is a hyphen. So it's three, and we've got the chloro, And then I've got four carbons in a row. Um, so it's going to be butte. Now I want to ask you, is there any other position that carbon, uh, that carbonyl or ketone function can be? Because if there is no other position it can be, you don't have to put the two in. You only have to put in the number when there's a possibility that another isomer could form. So can I put a double bond anywhere else if the chlorine is on the third one? I can't. Because if I tried to put a double bond on here, you know, on the third carbon, to make a ketone there, it's got to have the chlorine on the third carbon. I've got too many bonds for the carbon. So the only place I can have it is on the second carbon. So we don't have to give the position of the ketone group. We just simply say butanone. That's an E. OK, so it's 3-chlorobutanone. If, if there was a pinch and we could have moved it, then we'd have to put the position of the ketone in. Right, here's one we have to draw, propanamide. So you do need to know your functional groups. You need to know what an amide is. Do you know what an amide is? C double bond in H, yeah. So remember when I said amide, amine, very similar. But think of the D for the double bond. So that's where that C double bond O is. And prop means three. So start off by drawing three carbons. And the amide like an aldehyde, always has to be at the end. So you draw that in. Now, if I just left it and it didn't carry on, would that be marked correct? No. And the reason is I have not given every atom the correct number of bonds. So nitrogen has got three bonds, that's fine. The oxygen is fine, but the carbons have not got the correct number of bonds. So I either can put in what we call the semi-condensed structural form, where we just say CH2, or we do, can do the full structural, where we would write out all the bonds. Now, as I say, this is the method I recommend if you are not sure and you 
tend to make careless errors because you've got to make sure that every carbon has got four bonds and you can't give it too many or too few. Right, and then the last one is, I'm just going to change to a different color. Right, um, look always for the functional group. And, hi Jonathan. So if you look for the functional group, then, okay, you've got it there already. Well done, Jonathan. So it's an ester. So once you've got that, you need to then find out where is the, um, sorry, where is the alcohol part. And remember the bit with the oxygen by itself is from the alcohol. And that's why it's methyl, because we've only got one carbon there. And then the bit that has the carbonyl in it is the section from the carboxylic acid. So it's the end part. Because remember, carboxylic acid is always the dominant one. So that's why the butanoate comes at the end. And of course, the carbonyl is always the first carbon. So we count out like that. And well, we don't have any numbers here. So well done, jo Jonathan. So what I'm just going to show here next um, is, and I think, right, no, I've got to go down. Here are some examples from the, on the NZQA site. Notice, although I get very fussy, and we will be fussy when we mark the practice exams, about spacing, commas, hyphens, because we want to make sure that you are know the right way for the end of year. But notice that they're not that fussy when marking. Do you notice there's no hyphen there where there should be? There's a space there where there shouldn't be. Now, the way they mark, if there's a line, it means it contributes evidence towards a grade. If it's a circle, then it means you've done something wrong. Okay, so they've accepted that two chlorobutanone, even though I wouldn't in the practice exams, I'll tell you now. So all of these got it pretty much correct. You'll notice this is the, the first student here is the one that got excellence overall. This one you'll notice um, saw that the, uh, car, the ketone was on the second carbon, but then dropped it because they realized that the ketone didn't have any other position it could be in. So you didn't have to put the two in. And notice here there is an error. They put the they put the two in, but they put a comma in as well. You don't have commas between letters and numbers. But it was still accepted. But please don't think now that you can just do anything. Try and be as accurate as possible. So here's the next question. Okay, When a uh, 2-butanol undergoes a reaction with conch sulfuric acid, there are three possible um, products that can be formed. Now, when you've got conch and you've got heat, you've got very strong conditions. So what are you most likely to, to get when you have those strong conditions? Elimination. It's much harder breaking bonds. You need energy to break bonds. So it's harder to break bonds and remove a molecule like an HCl molecule or an H2O molecule, depending on what you're eliminating. Um, so you need to have very strong conditions for that. So look for those sort of clues if you're not sure. The other tip, if you weren't sure what to draw, is three isomers. Now, when you're thinking of isomers and you've got to draw three of them, it could often have geometric involved as well. So if I just go down to what was drawn. I hope it's not too fuzzy, these pictures. So the first one did everything correct. Um, I'll just go up quickly again. Notice the position of the OH. It's on the second uh, bond. So I can either get this hydrogen that's on this carbon going, oh, I should have done the other, other way, or it could be a hydrogen on that side. So those are the two options. And can you see the they've got they've drawn the cis. Now although they haven't shown 120 degree angles, they have shown at least the hydrogen on the same side. So that's totally acceptable. 
and they've drawn the trance on this end here as well. So that's the one isomer, uh, or two isomers, the geometric ones, and there's the other isomer where it went the other way. Do you think you would have been able to work that out? Okay, great. And you'll notice most of them, most of the students didn't have a problem. So the, the person that got excellence and merited, the person that got achieved got themselves a little bit muddled. Um, they, for some reason, decided to make it a branched chain. Um, they had the four carbons in a row. Remember the initial one was four carbons in a row. And the OH was on the second carbon. And for some reason, they moved a carbon atom. So always make sure you go back to your original, especially if you've got a two in a page, that you haven't moved a carbon atom because we haven't broken a carbon-carbon bond. Um, and let's see. What they've done here is that's a correct structure, but notice is it the same as that one? Yep. So what they've done here is they thought by drawing it in a straight line like this, that's one isomer. And if they try and show something else, like in a different way, they've drawn a different isomer. But remember, if you have another isomer, is you must have broken a bond and remade it somewhere else. So the atoms have a different arrangement in space. So these are basically the same isomer. So they've only drawn two isomers. So they've drawn two correct isomers, but not all three. And also, they've said this is a geometric isomer. Can that form a geometric isomerism? Can it form a geometric isomer? No, it can't. And the reason being is geometric isomer can only form if the groups on each carbon atom are different. So the two green ones need to be different groups, and they're not in this case because they're both hydrogen. This side's OK because an ethyl group is different to a hydrogen. So that side's OK. This side is not OK, so it can't form a geometric isomer. And the best way to explain this when you're trying to explain why something can form isomers or not is draw a diagram and label them A, B, C, D for the groups and say A and B must be different and C and D must be different. Okay. Any questions before I move on? No? Okay. Right. So the next part of the question is which of them will be formed in the smallest amount? So what they're looking for here is that rule. Now, is it Makovnikov's rule or Zaitsev's rule? It's about elimination. Zaitsev. The way I remember it is, uh, whoops, sorry. Sorry, is A for addition has the Makovnikov rule, and E for elimination has the Zaitsev rule. So A comes before E in the alphabet, and M comes before Z in the alphabet. So that's the way I link them. So we're doing the Zaitsev rule because we're doing elimination. And this person has done an excellent job at giving a good explanation. So they recognizing the geometric isomer is isomer one and three that they drew. Um, and they spoke about it being an asymmetric carbon so it can form the two different isomers and, and so on and so forth. They didn't actually, uh, oh, they did state uh, as Zaitsev's rule. The carbon with the most hyd uh, hydrogens loses its hydrogen atom. Um, well, they didn't state it directly. It was more indirectly that it was going against Zaitsev rule. So you should state that somewhere. But they were given, you'll see, 
um, an excellence for this. Okay, they had three dots there. The next one, next student also got three dots. So if you have a look, they say pretty much the same thing. So, um, oops, you've basically got, again, a minor product. They recognize that it's minor, so you must at least identify that. And it's, does, um, it doesn't actually state the rule, which is quite surprising that it got three dots. But if you look at this bit over here is what the examiner said. So the first one, they said very good ex um, explanation. This one is just a good explanation, but they felt it was enough to get the three dots for it. Uh, and it was identifying the groups eliminated. So don't just para don't just parrot to the rule and say, therefore, this is a minor product. Explain which groups were removed and use words like adjacent or next to. Those are like key words to use. And then if we go further down, OK, this is an example where the examiner said it was an incomplete um, explanation. And you can see it only, they only got one dot. And the reason why they got one dot is because they did identify what's going to be in the smallest amount. But then they went off on a tangent and talked about a primary. They got all muddled up talking about primary alkenes and secondary alkenes and tertiary alkenes and, and so on and so forth. So um, they got themselves muddled. OK. And no, so we'll go one more. And this isn't where the student got nothing. So I don't want to go you put you on the wrong track, but um, it is better to always write something down and guess than leave it blank because you don't know if you will say something correctly. So the student at least wrote something down, but in this case, they didn't. Notice, and I was actually quite surprised at this, um, they did mention Zaitsev's rule, um, and they did say an OH group would be eliminated, um, but they didn't like the way it was written, that it was hydroxide. They wanted it, you know, rather say the, the OH and the H on an adjacent carbon are eliminated from water, because it's not hydroxide coming off, and that remains hydroxide. Remember, in any elimination, you get a simple molecule coming off, like HCl or H2O. And the examiner decided, I mean, I would have given at least one point for this, but the examiner here decided, no, it wasn't enough. So it, you know, I can only sort of give you guidance, but it really also depends on what the examiner says on the day. Right, so here's an ex any questions before I carry on? No? Nope. OK, so here's an example where you've got to circle the functional group. And again, here's somewhere I would have disagreed, because a functional group, you'll notice when uh, these two that are circled down here, they marked that as correct, and they marked that as incorrect. Now, to me, this is the better one, because with an ester, it's really uh, R, C, actually, well, the R doesn't have to be there, but it's a C double bond. Sorry, I'm not drawing this very well. And it's got to then be an OR group, because if it was an ON group or an O something else group, it's not going to be an ester. You have to have a carbon there. But they actually didn't like that. So I'm thinking the poor teacher that was being very accurate actually that their kids a disadvantage. But um, so I don't know if you're getting the same examiner, but obviously they want the ester just to be the C double bond O, O, and nothing else. And I hope you know it is an ester, so that shouldn't be a problem. OK, here's an example where the student got muddled. He circled it correctly, but said a carboxyl group. Now, 
that is not correct. Okay. Um, now you take that triglyceride, that molecule we had uh, previously, and you, as I say, you'll be guaranteed to get some sort of polymer question and hydrolysis somewhere along the line. This exam paper had actually two of them, so we'll we'll do a peptide hydrolysis later. But you had to draw the um, co the condensed structures. Now, if it says the condensed structures and you drew out a full structure, I don't think they would penalize you. Okay? Um, and then, of course, you had to have the reagents and um, conditions required. So you had to say which ones was basic and which one was acidic. So this excellent student was really good. They highlighted the what was basic and what was acidic. And notice that in each case they identified the glycerol molecule. Um, and notice under basic hydrolysis they realized that the carboxylic acid wouldn't exist as an acid in a base because the acid would react with the base. So that's why they got marked that as correct. And in an acid, of course, a carboxylic acid can exist as an acid, so that was marked correct. Now, I hope you know in a base or in an acid, the alcohol still stays an alcohol because that's not an acidic hydrogen. Is that clear to both of you, Jonathan and Andrew? Yep. So it's just the carboxylic acids and the amine that's the acid base problem. The others not. So that didn't wasn't a problem and um, they got all that right. Here's an example of the person that got merit and you know, there were many ways you could answer this one, um, but they gave the reagents there to show it was acidic, so that's why it was underlined, and there it was basic. And can you see, they didn't just simply say basic, they gave it the actual base, so this was correct. They formed the salt. The, now, if I had drawn a line between the O and the NA, is going back here very quickly this would be wrong because that shows it's a covalent bond whereas we know it's an ionic bond it's a salt so what they drew was perfectly correct because they didn't put in this line which implies covalent now this notice they've circled it they did draw an alcohol um, but it's wrong because remember what the triglyceride looked like? It was, I'm just, remember it was O like this, and then you had the C double bond O, whoops, and so on and so forth. So if you cutting it up, uh, down, you know, if you, cutting it over there and you're hydrolyzing it. Sorry, I meant to do a different color. Um, there it is. Okay, so if you're cutting it down the middle, you're going to form a tri triol on there. So you've got to add an H to each of those oxygens. Do you think you would have been able to do the hydrolysis without a problem? Yep, great. Okay, so here's an example where a person didn't do it uh, in that they didn't break. Remember where I said you had to break it between the O and the C double bond? They didn't break it there, and so they landed up with an ester instead of an alcohol. Right, so they got nothing for that. Um, and here's one where, for some reason, they brought in, they got, muddled between an, the peptide link and the ester link. Um, but it could be because they decided that ammonia was the basic medium. So I could see where that they came in, um, but 
stick to straight OH minus for base and H plus for acid or H3O plus for acid. Don't try and use NH4 plus for, uh, for an acid because it's really weakly acidic. And you're told, um, actually no, you're not told whether what type of acid you used. Right, so this is now the explanation and they were given excellence for this. And notice, I'm just going to highlight on the underlined things because you were asked to give reaction conditions. So notice that where they're underlined, it does give the reaction conditions. And notice how they put in the aqueous there as well. Um, so that's, they were following the what, what was required. And they give really detailed, um, so for instance with the base, they're talking about the salt being formed. So when it reacts, then you get the the salt being formed. So they were really detailed. And as the examiner says, very good comparison and contrast using conjunctions. Um, I'm not quite sure what they meant there. Conjunctions to me is a grammar, English grammar version. Um, so I'm not quite sure what they meant there. And can you see, they mentioned reagents, they mentioned all conditions. So heat, and uh, I think they actually used heat there as well. Um, yes, can you see? Heat will also help the reaction to, uh, to occur. So if I go to the next one, uh, they did recognize it was hydrolysis, but, uh, and they did, they only gave a vague uh, one for that, but I think that's still okay. And they did at least give that one. And it, but they said a carboxylate salt. They should have said a sodium carboxylate salt would be a, just that little bit more detail. And you can see that they liked the acid and the fact that the salt was drawn, but they were penalized because they didn't realize about the trial. And this one got one dot um, because they did identify some conditions. So notice the, they did say conch HCl. It would still work in conch HCLs, or they could have just said uh, HCl. Um, they identified the wrong um, alcohol. So they've underlined the alcohol and they've just ignored the methanol. But here they've circled the methanol, so that counted against them. Um, they recognized there was a sodium salt, but it's just not enough detail. But notice they did get an achieve for it because there was enough there. So as I say, always try and put something down. This is a student that tried to do it using ammonia. And so they started going tracking into amines, and it just was a wrong decision. Right. Now this is, as I say, you will get also a question in some way where you have to identify two unknowns or um, sometimes it's a whole list and you've got to then do a whole method. Or in this case, what they did last year, they gave you three sets of how you would identify. Uh, now notice the person that got excellence looked at all of these bits. Okay, observations linked to species. So you can't just say, I used a chromate and, uh, and the color changed from orange to green. You've got to say the orange dichromate oxidized the so-and-so and formed a green chromium 3 plus iron. So you must make sure that you link it to the species. So if you tick all those boxes, you, you won't have a problem. So do you notice they'll have water dampened litmus paper? Does dry litmus paper work? So in other words, if you don't have water present, will your litmus paper change color? No, it won't. Correct. Um, because it's you've got to form from the water the hydroxide and the hydronium ion, which latches onto the litmus molecule and changes its color. So it's You've either got to add water or you've got to dampen the litmus paper. So this person knew that. And they knew that the litmus paper would turn blue. So they've underlined that bit. 
because of the hydroxide ions. So they've um, done the reagents, so water. They've done um, litmus, or you could say the water is a condition. Okay, and the observation, have you noticed they've linked it to the species? It turned blue due to the presence of the hydroxide ions. And then they've done the explanation because it's basic. And they've done that. Um, so they've used the understanding also of the 3.6, um, the 3060 series. They've, they've brought a bit in here. And then prop, uh, propanamide is not basic, so there's no color change. So they did a brilliant thing over there. OK, this one, next one says propanamine is, is basic and propanamide is neutral. So they've done that. And they've also been good. They've mentioned that it's damp. OK, and the, they said it should turn the red litmus blue and there would be no reaction. The difference between why this one got better than that one, uh, the one below, is do you notice things? They linked the color change to a species. So that would be uh, good. Um, the next one, propanamide, it was made by adding um, ammonia to acyl chloride. You'll notice the student had nothing underlined. They got themselves uh, totally muddled. They digressed into propyl chloride, and I'm not quite sure what. They just got muddled. OK, but at least they tried. So rather try than leave something blank. OK, here's an example for propanone and propanel. So if I'm doing propanone, and so I've got a ketone, what is propanel? It's an aldehyde, correct. So basically, the one thing you know is this propanel can be oxidized, and the propanone can't be oxidized. OK, so you've, you've got that idea, Andrew. Great. And notice, OK, uh, they've done the orange dichromate turns blue-green, although they did not, uh, there they said blue-green chromium 3 plus iron. So they've linked things to the species. So make sure you, you do that if the question asks for that. And uh, they've, uh, they've given the reagents acidified dichromate. It could work with dichromate, but it doesn't do it very well. It needs that acid to go. Um, and then you'll see here they said it will remain orange because it can't be oxidized. So that was a brilliant one. Here they didn't, um, it says the propanel will oxidize to form a silvery mirror. So that was fine. That wasn't a problem. They needed more, though. What part, what part of the silver, you know, when we form the silver mirror, what is actually happening? What is in that Tollens reagent? The silver, well, uh, it won't be silver chloride. Um, you, well, you take, you can start off with sil silver chloride, but then you've got to add ammonia because you've got to get it into solution. It's an Ag plus iron um, that then gets reduced to silver by the aldehyde, or the Ag plus iron will oxidize the silver. Uh, sorry, will oxidize the aldehyde. So there just wasn't enough that they asked for in the question. Just at a straightforward level, I mean, I would have given a chi for this because they got the idea that you need the silver mirror test, but they didn't get in more detail. This one got a bit muddled. You talked about Beeling's solution instead of Feeling's solution uh, over there, okay? Um, and he talked about that you had the copper 2. Um, if you just said the copper 2 iron, it doesn't have to be a citrate. You can make it as a tartrate or anything like that. But it's basically a copper 2 iron that should form the brick red copper 1 plus precipitate. 
So he's linking the blue copper, self, uh, copper ions and he's linking that very nicely. Um, I'm not quite sure why I didn't have more underlining here. And then this one, they talk about the Tollens reagent. So there they underlined the Tollens. So that was accepted, I suppose, for achieved. Um, and it was, they gave more observations, because you have to give observations, although that was also an observation as far as I'm concerned. And they said, gave, gave the same thing. So the last one is propanoyl chloride and propyl propanoate. So this is an acyl chloride. What is that? The second one. It's an ester. And the big difference between those two is pretty much water. Add water, this will fizz like anything and um, HCl gas would uh, escape. Add this to water and it just forms another layer. It doesn't dissolve. Um, so that's what this excellent student did. The water is underlined um, and you can see the propanol chloride reacts vigorously with the water and it forms fumes of HCl gas. So can you see they spell out the observations very nicely and it talks about being acidic and so the water dampened blue litmus paper um, so they spelt it out. So this person got all three to detail, so you got excellence. The merit one, I mean, I didn't put them all under each other, um, but he got two. Um, the chief one, actually, they decided had sufficient out of all three. So although they didn't necessarily underline it, they thought there was enough there. Any questions on that? So you can hear they said all species fully identified they decided that the merit student had identified two sets of students, two sets of uh, compounds. And um, this one they didn't like as much because they said they should have mentioned that feelings required heat. So got sort of two and a half there instead of a full three. And this one managed to identify. Um, Two. Well, that's yes. It said the species were not identified. So by that, they gave observations but didn't link it to the species. So like that green chromium 3 plus ion. Any questions before I move on? No? Okay. I see time is always going fast. Now here's an example. I really thought something like this wouldn't come up in the new standard. So I told my students last year, oh, don't worry, I don't think you're going to get much on, on experiments. And then we got this detailed experiment thing. Now what I've shown sort of on the lower downs from the excellent student, notice how they write on the exam paper and they're trying to jot down what it is before they turn the page and start writing. The more things you write down and you get your um, you know, know where you're coming from, where you're going to, the easier it is going to, to be right a discussion. So they're starting with an alcohol, they're adding HCl, um, then they add saturated sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now when you think of sodium hydrogen carbonate, there should be two things you think of. One is it's basic, and what is the other thing? If it reacts for sodium hydrogen carbonate, what do you form? Carbon dioxide, correct. So um, that explains, and you can use that to relieve the pressure. You're getting carbon dioxide being formed. Now think of why do you add a base to this once you've your 10 minutes are up? What have you added originally? So number of your typing to mm. neutralize the acid. So if you get given something like this, try and you know, and you think, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Try and just sort of work it out. What do I know about these compounds that would then help you 
work out what they want. Um, so just think, what do I know about sodium hydrogen carbonate? And hopefully you would think it's a base, and then you can think, well, why do I want to add a base? It's to react with any acid. Now here's another one. The next step is involving anhydrous sodium sulfate. So if you, you know, you might wonder, what on earth is sodium sulfate? What does it do? But the clue is in the word anhydrous. Why, what's going to, if something is anhydrous, what will it react with? So a few of you are typing. Water. It's going to become hydrous. So the very fact you had to heat it originally to remove yeah. the water, it means when you have it exposed, it's going to just suck up water. So you can get anhydrous copper sulfate, you can get anhydrous sodium sulfate, you can get anhydrous calcium chloride. So they could use any of those um, that you might not have come across in the booklet. But if you see that word anhydrous, you know that that substance wants to react with water and that's what it's going to do. And you can see why you've taken the aqueous layer, you've discarded it, so you're now just trying to suck up the last bit of water that could still be in my organic um, compound. And then, of course, now you're transferring, and this little bit at the end is your distillation. So most students, I think, did work out you'd get CO2, and that sort of helped. Hopefully you worked out it was to remove the um, excess acid. So notice how this, this excellent student has written an equation in just to get their thoughts clear. And they've used that then in their discussion. So they've said it's to neutralize the excess HCl. So that was why you added um, the HCl. And let's go down a bit. The others also got that correct. Then the next one was why did anhydrous sodium sulfate. The, here the excellent student got confused. They thought it was a catalyst. But again, the student wrote something down. So write it down. Um, they hadn't a clue what it was, but they had a go. So always have a go. You, you could have got it right. Uh, here the clue was in the word anhydrous. Okay. And um, so here the student also had a go, but he didn't deal with the anhydrous word. He just saw sodium sulfate as a salt. So he just said something about that. And one person here said anhydrous, picked up on that clue, and realized it was the water. Um, this one got a dot, but I can't see the dot being for this over here, because they said it's not a catalyst. So um, I'm not quite sure why they got that dot. It might have been for something related to just that previous, perhaps the previous one. And here the uh, examiner's commented the um, student hasn't uh, carried out some practical chemistry, very likely. Right, so let's have a quick check. If I'm trying to now uh, do step four, which is to purify my compound, which of those four sets of equipment should I use? One, two, three, or four? I'm trying to purify my final compound. One, correct. So it's a distillation. Two of them got it correct. The other two chose reflux. And they don't seem to do any carry errors. So if you made a mistake in one part and you carry on with that same mistake, they don't acknowledge that. Um, so if you get it wrong, and you get it wrong subsequently. So this basically was saying, um, you know, you've, they, I thought of, they did a really good job here, where they said um, distillation requires the wanted product to have a lower boiling point. That was very good. So they said, had a full discussion. Because I can't distill something if my wanted compound has a boiling point of 150 degrees um, when, say, I've got an aqueous solution. Because the water is going to distill first. And then I'll be left with my compound in the gunk. And it won't be very pure. So I don't think I've actually stressed, stressed that in my teaching. But you can see this 
person was well taught and so that they've noted that and the examiner liked that very much and got an excellent answer. Um, and they also explained about condensation and they explained about the cold water so they, they really gave a detailed explanation. Oops. Right, then this one had had an idea and so got at least to merit level um, because they got the idea of boiling, it has to be volatile and um, they also mentioned it had to have the lower boiling point and so it would be condensed back to a liquid. But they didn't do it quite as full as the, the previous one. Then these two were incorrect because they went on to reflux. So they had the right idea for reflux but the wrong idea for where it fitted in. Okay, question three now is all on uh, pretty much reaction schemes and they did put something else at the end. One thing I noticed they didn't have in this exam, they didn't have optical isomers. So although we say you know some things are guaranteed to come up, because I would have said optical isomers would have been guaranteed to come up, uh, there was no big issue about drawing in three dimensions and uh, chirality and so on and so forth. So none of the students really did this but if you get a reaction scheme like this I would just like for that practical one I would really use this part to try and work out what I've got. So I would draw out over here very even if I leave out the hydrogens, but just to work out what I've got. So here I've got a double bond, I'm adding water, and so I'm going to, the very fact that it says I've got a minor product means I've got two. Um, so now you've got to apply the rule, we're adding, so it's Makovnikov. So where is the OH going to add? To the first carbon or the second carbon? The OH, uh, well, okay, perhaps that's a bit of a trick question because you might be seeing it's minor and I was going, just generally it would actually, the OH would add to the second carbon, but so that'll be the major product, but because it's the minor product and I think that's why there was that confusion and you had different answers, the OH adds to the second one. Then I oxidize um, and if I oxidize, I've got two products I could form. What are those two products? Depending on how much I oxidize it. So quite a few of you are typing. Okay, the aldehyde or the carboxylic acid. Now, Andrew, you are correct, a ketone, if I had a secondary alcohol. So that actually is on this side. This is the major product where, um, I'm sorry, my C didn't work very well, where I'm going to have my OH over here. So I will get my ketone over there. Okay, right. Here, I'm going to get the alcohol, but when I oxidize, now some students thought that product D was the aldehyde, and they got that wrong, because you do need to see where the next flow is. Do you know of any reaction of an aldehyde with thionyl chloride, or with an alcohol? Have you, you don't, that's right, so you, you haven't learnt any of those reactions, so you know it can't be the aldehyde and that it must have gone all the way through to the carboxylic acid. So you've now got over here your carboxylic acid. So just as I say, you can just sketch it out as you're just trying to see where to go, because if you carry on with this continuity, you'll get an idea of where to go. So if I have an ester and I add my alcohol A, um, so there are my three carbons. 
Now alcohol A, remember, is this one over here. So hopefully you would have got that one correct. So if I'm adding my alcohol now, it's I'll change this color. So I've got that's the carbon the OH is added onto. So I'm going to draw that carbon. And then I've got to add my other carbons to it because I've got one on each side there. So I've done a double thing. But can you see how I landed up with that? So these are, say, are sketches. You've got to draw them properly when you um, do them in, in the right space. But this is just to see what to do. Now here's the other ester. And this is when we have alcohol B. So you're not going to have a branch chain. It's going to be a linear chain. It'll just be a propyl group. And then here we form the cyanyl chloride and go to product F. I just see we've got two minutes left, so that's why I'm going to go fast. So the first person for excellence got everything correct. Okay. Do you notice, by the way, how they draw full structural things? Unless you're really confident, do that. Notice even how they make sure they don't write OH here and then a bond. They're very particular. They know that the oxygen has the two bonds, not the hydrogen. So they were beautifully correct there. Um, if you draw full structural formulas, you are less likely to go wrong. This person got everything, uh, most things right, but got stuck with the aldehyde. They didn't think further. They, um, you know, so that that made them just go wrong. Okay, um, and this one as well, they got stuck with the aldehyde. So look at the scheme in total so you get it right. And this one went correct in the first two, but then got muddled. They um, confused the, they thought a secondary alcohol became uh, an aldehyde and a primary alcohol became a um, ketone. They just simply got muddled. So if you have it on your reaction scheme, you should get that right. OK, very quickly, one last thing I want to just quickly do is um, this is another hydrolysis. So you get lots of hydrolysis on this one. I mean, I, I would have made this an optical isomer question. Um, but basically, whenever you get a hydrolysis, just like an ester, look for the peptide link. And if you notice, as I say, if they go C O N and then they go um, C O N, then your molecule, um, I'll just change that into a different color, you should have the same isomer. Whoops, Daisy. Sorry, that, that went wrong. But anyway, I'm running out of, out of time. So, that's the same thing, and that is then repeated. Can you see there's a repeated structure? Check that you have the repeated structure. And then you can draw the monomer. And notice um, this one was correct, the excellent student. So was the next one. I just wanted to point this one out. This person had the right idea and then did something silly by giving nitrogen an extra bond. That's why writing it out in full is good because you know nitrogen should only have three bonds and not four. But notice the um, examiner did not penalize them for that. Notice also, and again, I'm very fussy, you make the bond between the bonding atoms. So I would draw it between the two C atoms, not between the C and the H but they weren't penalized. Here's another one where I will certainly mention if you do it in the practice exam, because hopefully you'll do the right thing in, in, when it counts. OK, and then, as I say, we're over time now, so I'm going to stop. Um, but you can go online, and if you want to see how the, uh, there's, a, as I say, an excellence merit achieved and so on um, did, then there is also the examiner's comment. So it's a very good discussion. 
uh, Kate was missing heat, so he got an E7 and not an E8 because of that. And then basically most people didn't do very well with hydrolysis. So, so hydrolysis is guaranteed to come up. In this exam, it came up twice. Any questions? Right, no? Okay, good luck for the exams next week. As I say, try and write them next week. Otherwise, as long as you write them within the first two weeks and that we get them after that, uh, that's the important bit. If, you, if they come in too late, we can't use them for derived grade. And you're welcome to email me if you've got any questions um, on your chemistry. Okay, so I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for waiting through all the when we when the system froze. Right, there won't be a lesson next week. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.